Well, during these next few moments, we want to take some time to go to God's Word and remember what Jesus did for us. You know, it was the summer of 1995. I had just started my first real job at an architectural firm in western Pennsylvania. Uh, I was only 19 years old, and I was on my way. Uh, About six months into my new job, uh, we as an office were hosting uh, a gathering for all of our business owners, hospital executives, university presidents, and school representatives that had done business with us. And it was to be a formal party. So tuxedos and evening gowns were uh, to be expected for this particular party. Uh, We had spent the entire day at the office getting everything ready for this party. We had everything immaculately cleaned and everything organized the way it should be. Tables were set for all the pricey food and the drinks. Ice sculptures were in the lobby there in the office. And we had a three to four person uh, orchestra, mini orchestra, that was brought in. So everything was a real big deal for this office party. Well, I arrived about 15 minutes early that Friday night. And as I walked up to our particular studio, being that I was all dressed up, I decided that I was going to make a grand entrance to my friends and co-workers. And so I was going to do my best James Brown impersonation and dance my way into the office. And so as I entered into the studio, I slid my feet across the carpet. And as I did this, I heard this collective gasp among all of my co-workers. Uh, What I didn't tell you is that I had just shined my shoes and now all the black shoe polish that was on my shoes was now stretched across the studio floor on this light tan carpet and it was right in the middle of the entire office studio. Obviously, when I looked down and saw the floor, I was stunned and embarrassed because the mess was everywhere and you couldn't miss it. And so quickly, my friend Reed said, Timmy, you get out of this office and you, you get out of the way and I'll clean everything up after you. And so in a, just a few, few moments, I went down over to the other part of the office and Reed and his friends were gathering around the floor, getting all the cleaning supplies, trying to clean up the mess. They were working frantically, trying to make sure that everything was fine. And I came up about 20 minutes later and Reed had managed, amazingly enough, to get all that black shoe polish off the carpet. Uh, Reed had cleaned up my mess, and he had erased my shame, and he probably saved my job that day. You know, we come here on this Good Friday because someone cleaned up our mess. He erased our shame, and he saved our lives. And his name is Jesus Christ. You know, while our lives were stained with sin and we couldn't erase our mess that we had made because of sin, Jesus came to our rescue and he provides for us hope. And it happened through the wondrous cross. I want to read to you a passage of scripture found in Romans chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. Paul says this, Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, the cross really does not really make sense unless we fully understand why the cross had to happen. You know, scripture makes very clear that every one of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all broken God's perfect law of righteousness. We've all sinned. We've all failed. And humanity, as a result, is completely broken. They're completely sinful. 
We see that as we read here in Romans chapter 5. Paul makes clear that because of Adam, way back in the Garden of Eden, in his fall, in Adam and Eve's fall, every human, everyone in, in all of humanity has been tainted with sin. And because of that, we have a death sentence over us. You know, in recent weeks, the media has been talking rightly so, about all this coronavirus and things that have been going on. And the concern early on was that everything would get out of control. And it's still a concern today that it's going to somehow affect everyone. But the truth is that since the Garden of Eden, there has been a sin pandemic that has affected everyone. And the death rate isn't just 1% or 2%. The death rate is 100%. We all will die, barring the fact that Jesus will come back first. We all will pass away from this life because there's a death sentence over us because of sin. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The death rate is still 100%. You see, sin is serious because what sin is, is it's a rebellion against God and his ways. It's It's a desire to do things my own way and just kind of, push God aside and go my own route. And so as a result of Adam and Eve's sin and subsequently all of our sins, death spread to all people. You know, we can try to ignore our sin, and a lot of people try to do that. Some try to excuse their sin and say, well, you know, it's because of this that happened in my life that I, I sinned. Or maybe it was a family member that had this happen. And no doubt that we have people in our lives that have caused great harm to us. But all of us cannot excuse what we've done wrong, no matter what has been done wrong to us. A lot of us want to cover up our sin or minimize it and say, well, you know, it's no big deal. It didn't really hurt anyone. But the truth is, our sin is rebellion against God. And we are guilty before God. We made a mess that we couldn't clean up. We are sick and we need a cure. And so all of us need a Savior. A lot of people go around our culture today and they don't realize they need to be saved from anything. Christians, we as Christians use this term, we need to be saved. And, and we use that, that term rightly so. But a lot of people think, well, what do I need to actually be saved from? Well, another way of saying it is we need to be rescued from our sin. We need somebody to pay the debt that we owe to God because of our sin. You see, we can't cure our own sickness when it comes to sin. We need someone from the outside who will rescue us from eternal death and separation from God. And there's only one who could do this, Jesus Christ. Why is he the only one that could do this? Well, Jesus was sinless. He, everything that he did, everything that he thought and, and performed and every attitude he had was pure and righteous before God. Jesus never rebelled. He never sinned. And he was not guilty of sin in any way. He was perfect. You could say that he was not infected with the sin virus like all of us were. He was completely innocent because he knew no sin. You know, in verse 15 of this passage that I just read, it just, Paul makes very clear that death entered through one man. He's referring to Adam way back in the Garden of Eden. But he also says that the free gift of grace comes through one man. And he's referring to Jesus. So just as Adam and Eve had failed in the garden, and we as humanity have been tainted with sin, through Jesus Christ, what he did, that one man did on the cross, God in the flesh, how he took our sins upon himself and he died for our sin and took upon himself our shame. You know, the cross was a brutal, painful way to die. You know, the term excruciating that we use in our terminology means to cause great pain or anguish. But you know, the actual root word for excruciating comes from the word crucifixion. Jesus died an excruciating death on that cross. Why? Because he loved you and he loved me. And he saw our predicament, that we were destined for hell because of our sin, to be separated from God. But Jesus came and died in our place. He took upon our sins himself that we might find the hope of eternal life. 
So why is the cross so wondrous? Well, actually, there's too many reasons to count. If we could have all eternity, we could not capture all the points to be made as why the cross is so wondrous. But this evening, what I would like to do is provide three points or three ways in which we can understand that the cross is indeed wondrous. The first reason why the cross is wondrous is because we are justified before God. He mentions this, Paul does, in verse 16. But the term justified is actually a legal term. It's used in reference to a person being in good legal standing with the court. And so when Jesus died, when we repent of our sins and put our faith and trust in him, We are made righteous because of his blood and because of his sacrifice, and we are in good legal standing with God. In other words, our sins are taken away because they were placed upon Jesus Christ. And because of that, we are justified before God. That's a a big theological term, but it's an important word to remember because we as Christians are made right when we repent and when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us on that blessed cross. You know, what Jesus did on that cross was die for our sin. He paid a debt that we owed to God, so much so that when we repent and when we believe in him, we are now in good standing with God. We are now made new, and we are cured on the inside. You know, sometimes you'll hear people when facing death speak of of making peace with God. You'll often hear that term floated around there. But friends, the cross is the only way that peace with God is made possible. The blood of Jesus reverses the curse of sin and the dead are raised to life. And so you could say his blood is the antivirus. His blood is the cleansing power that changes us from the inside. And the cross is wondrous because we are justified before God. The second reason why the cross is wondrous is because it is proof that God's grace and love abound to us. In verse 20, Paul says this, Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. You know, grace is getting something you don't deserve. And because of sin, we need grace. We need to get something that we don't deserve. We, all all of us have sinned, but we do not deserve the grace of God. But God, because he is rich in love, extends his grace. And the cross is a manifestation of of God's grace to us. You know, we cannot solve our sin on our own. A lot of people have this perspective, well, my life is sort of like a a weight being weighed on the scale. If I do enough good things that outweigh my bad things, that somehow God's going to somehow let me into heaven. But friends, as we examine our lives and we see what Scripture has to say, we see clearly that our lives, the scale is always tipped to sin. But because of Jesus, we can find hope that his grace is sufficient for us. It's not a matter of things that we can do to earn God's salvation, but it's because of what Jesus did for us that we might have hope. Nothing we could ever do would be able to cancel out the problem of sin. You know, crushing five million oranges still won't give you an apple. We cannot cure our own sin. We need God's grace. You know, Martin Luther once said it this way, God does not give grace freely in the sense that he will demand no satisfaction, but he gave Christ to be the satisfaction for us. You know, sin is a serious thing before God, and if you don't believe me, the fact that God had to send his only son Jesus to die on the cross for our sin shows us not only God's love, but the seriousness of of our offenses before a holy and a righteous God. But God was gracious enough to give us Jesus to die on on the cross for our sins. And the cross is wonderful because it demonstrates that God is gracious and that he loves you and he loves me 
no matter what we've done in our past, no matter our many failures that we've made in the past, God loves us anyway, and he died for you and for me. The cross is wondrous because God's grace and love abounds to us. The third reason that I want to give you this evening of why the cross is wondrous is because the cross provides, you could say, a way or a path or a door to eternal life. The cross makes eternal life possible. In verse 21, Paul says that God's grace abounds all the more so that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's no other way to God the Father but through Jesus Christ. There's no other way to heaven but the cross. And this is why the cross is wondrous to us. You know, throughout the centuries, people have tried to make great sacrifices. They've offered themselves to be able to help others. You think of rescue workers who have risked their lives to save people from perilous situation. We even think during these, this coronavirus season, how many medical workers have gone in, out of their way to be able to risk their own health, to be able to care for those who are in need and those who are infected with a virus. That's a sacrifice. And that's something to be honored. We think of soldiers that have spilled their blood on the battlefield to purchase freedom, the freedom that we have together, as, even as Americans. We think of people that have taken bullets to stand in front of people that they love. There's been many great examples of people that have offered themselves and spilled their blood to sacrifice for good things. But friends, Good Friday is the single greatest sacrifice in human history. What Jesus did on the cross is the number one, the single greatest sacrifice ever made. Because as wonderful as some of those other sacrifices that some of us have made and others have made for us, they pale in comparison because what Jesus did for us was an eternal sacrifice. He rescues us from the pit of hell and rescues us by God's righteous hand and gives us eternal life. You know, the worship team just a few moments ago sang Isaac Watts' famous hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And I hope you've been singing and joining in worship in your homes. But I want to read some of those lyrics together as we just reflect on Jesus' wondrous cross. The hymn says this, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his dead, his hands, his feet, Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, and my all. You know, it's interesting, Watts based this hymn on Galatians chapter 6, Verse 14, where Paul says, Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Jesus' sacrifice is the greatest single sacrifice ever to be made or ever could be made. And we want to celebrate and remember on this Good Friday the cross of Jesus. And the cross is wondrous because of three things among many. Number one, that we are justified before God. Number two, it proves that God's grace and love abound to us. And number three, it provides a way to eternal life and the only way to God through Jesus Christ. You know, C.S. Lewis one of my favorite authors, Christian authors and theologian and an apologist, he wrote his famous book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. 
And you, if you remember that story, Aslan, who's a type of a Christ figure, but he's a lion there, after he is restored to life and the stone table is broken, he says something that is remarkable. He says, The witch would have it known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. You know, on Good Friday, death itself worked backwards. Good Friday. How can one describe such a day? The wrongdoing of all humanity putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of a cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Heaven watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God. Our sin and our debt, overcoming. Jesus. Here is our king, obliterated. The enemy laughing, his plans unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We had heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now, we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believed there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single greatest sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? Just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single greatest sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization. We can say that God is for us. Now we know better. There is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong, the blind can see, the lost are found. We had heard the stories of old, yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken, behold freedom rising. Now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing, his plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all, the naked humiliation, the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails, our sin stopped his heart, and yet this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us. The bright light of our future all in one moment, bringing death to 
to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday. Powerful video, and I want to just help us all to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. What a wonderful Savior that we serve, and we want to worship him uh, through this time where we celebrate and remember uh, what Jesus did for us on the cross by receiving communion together. If you have your elements together, whether it be bread or juice or whatever's close by, if you want to bring them into your living rooms or wherever you're at, if you're in your office or bedroom, and we're going to just receive these elements together. And I want to just say this, parents, I'll let you be discerning as far as whether or not your kids are ready to receive the elements at this time. The most important thing is that we understand what Jesus did for us and his death upon the cross and that we put our faith and trust in him. And if you've done that, if you as a a young person or an older person, whatever age you're at, if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, when we want to invite you to be able to participate in this time together. I, can't, I can say that this is actually the first time I've ever done communion just like this as we're challenged over distance. But Jesus is with us as his Holy Spirit indwells us. You know, we as Christians regularly practice and participate in what is referred to as a sacrament of the Lord's table. And we use often a lot of different names that are associated with it. Obviously, we call it the Lord's table. Some might call this time the Eucharist. Uh, We uh, commonly call it communion. Uh, Some of us might question, well, where do we get this word communion? Uh, what, what does that really mean? Well, it's interesting, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 16, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, The cup of blessing that we bless is not a participation in the blood of Christ. It's, he's asking a rhetorical question. The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? You know, the word in there, in that verse, participation, is actually translated communion. We get that word communion from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 16. And this word communion or participation means fellowship. It means that we are uniting together in partnership. That we're doing this together because of Christ. And Paul, what he's saying in that verse is... In eating and in drinking, we as Christians are participating in and we are uniting with and we have fellowship and communion through the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. You know, this is a mystery. We can't fully grasp what is going on during this time, but this is a means of grace for us. We celebrate and we remember Jesus. And so when we eat of the bread, And when we drink of the cup, we are partaking of Christ. Symbolically, we are participating in the new covenant that he is in us and that we are in him. We are joined together with Christ. And Jesus calls us to follow in his footsteps, to participate, to commune, to unite together in partnership and to lay down our lives as a response to follow Jesus. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, and my all. Jesus, as he was gathered with his disciples, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, Jesus also took the cup. And he said, this is the blood of a new covenant. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. 
At this time, the worship team is going to be playing some instrumental music as we continue in this time of worship. I want to just encourage you, wherever you're at and whoever's in your room, if you want to partake of the elements, even if you're just by yourself, if you have those elements with you, we want to encourage you in these next few moments to ponder the sacrifice that Jesus made for you and the wondrous cross and to repent of sin and put your trust in in Jesus Christ. As we receive the elements together, I will return once again and close in prayer. Jesus, we worship you and we praise you for your great sacrifice for our sins. Jesus, you cleaned up our mess and you made us new. And we worship you, we praise you, and Lord, we give you our all. Lord, we take up our cross and we follow you. Lord, we repent of sin, we repent of worry, of doubt, of anger, of fear. Jesus, transform us. Make us like you by your grace and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we worship you and we praise you for your death on the cross and the hope of your resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. We want to thank you for tuning in tonight as we remember Jesus' great sacrifice. I want to invite you to once again join us this upcoming Sunday at 10 o'clock. We're going to celebrate the fact that Jesus didn't remain on the cross, but he arose from the grave. And so I want to just encourage you between now and then to take time of reflection of Jesus' sacrifice and also consider whom you might invent, uh, invite to come and join us as we worship the Lord together at 10 o'clock on Sunday. God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight.